All right, so this time we got technically part two, but mostly a general overview of the origin of the family, private property, and the state. Now let's do it. All right, there's our contents. I kept it simple this time. All right, first question that we should ask all the liberals in the walls is the family a static formation that has never changed throughout time and was ordained by God? Anyone want to answer the question? No. Correct. I said that, that just the question on the slide. Okay, obviously no. Um, so... Ooh. The family is a social relation or social construct, if you want to put it that way, is the same thing. Just like any political, jur juridical, religious, philosophical systems, etc., it develops over time and space according to, say it with me, class, the material conditions. Conditions, yeah. That's right. Um, and I just put in a note here. <clears throat> Basically, yes, the family or something called a family um, does seem to be pretty, I guess we'll use the word natural for now, but like it, it's pretty much normal, like not just in humans, but actually many animal species, you will find families, uh, different family structures. But even though something is natural or naturally occurring that does not mean it is fixed in time or space that is metaphysical and that is wrong family structures just like anything fluctuate throughout time and space based on the material conditions which means they are not fixed they are more fluid and can change over time based on how things develop and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit so um, this quote hopefully gives a good overview right of this progression uh, or at least uh, pro uh, not progression in the sense of like making progress I just mean like this is the series of changes right uh, so it's, he says uh, the study of primitive history however reveals conditions where the men live in polygamy and their wives in polyandry at the same time and their common children are therefore considered common to them all and these conditions, in their turn, undergo a long series of changes before they finally end in monogamy. The trend of these changes is to narrow more and more the circle of people comprised within the common bond of marriage, which was originally very wide, until at last it includes only a single pair, the dominant form of marriage today. So he's kind of laying out the roadmap here, the historical roadmap of uh, the family. And I will just quickly mention off the top, that when we're talking about the the family, like what are we, what what relations are we looking at specifically? It mostly has to do with um, marital relations and like children, the rearing of children, essentially. Um, that's mostly what he talks about in this text. Um, of like, wasn't what, he at some point? So, well, wasn't he at some point uh, like somewhat criticized though because I, I recall hearing there are some uh, historical inaccuracies in his analysis oh, um, yeah, which you, I mean, it's a given it's, well yeah, you, yeah you, you missed my preface slightly so yeah I, I was saying in the beginning that oh sorry yeah I just joined yeah um, yeah I already mentioned that some things in here are wrong and have been updated in the body of literature in anthropology at large Sorry. but more specifically I, I i did a little digging um so it does seem like there is a unfortunately like the mainstream of anthropological research from what i can gather is unfortunately been rather co-opted by either postmodernist thinking or neoliberal thinking um I'd, yeah, I'd say so. So, so I, like I said, I, I'm not an anthropologist. I don't know the body of literature, but from just a cursory look and some criticism of it, that seems to be the... I mean, that's not shocking. I think a lot of social sciences do fall under that um, umbrella of, like, 
capitulating to neoliberalism. But um, the implications of that, of course, are an abandonment of a uh, materialist worldview of anthropology, right? Um, as well as an abandonment of, and this surprised me a lot, actually, but, like, there are actually a lot of people who just completely abandon, like, the historical viewpoint, which is crazy to me because anthropology seems like the study of the history of humanity. So, like, neglecting historical change over time seems like the whole fucking point. I don't know. That's bizarre to me. But apparently that is what neoliberalism does to a motherfucker. So, yeah. Um, that's something that we will focus on and just looking at basically, like, what did... Angles and Morgan contribute that is valuable. I, I try to just gloss over some of the stuff that isn't valuable or just not worth our time. Um, there's a lot in there, especially on like specific historical examples. And I think those just need to be addressed on a case by case basis. I'm not the person to do that. A actually trained anthropologist probably is the, is the one to do that. I, I know it has been done. Uh, in the end, at the end of the PowerPoint, um, I do have a few recommended additional readings just for like a couple, just a couple of them um, that do give more accurate information, like more updated stuff. And even then, I think the book I referenced is like from 1981. So even that's not the most recent. Um. Sorry to interject. I, I recently took a pretty extensive anthropology class, and um, uh, the textbook I had was also fairly decent, so uh, I'd like to recommend that uh, whenever you, you do recommend things uh, eventually. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so anyways, this is the pref This is the beginning, right? He's setting, laying out his thesis that um, this institution of the family like anything in human society has developed over time. It's hopefully not too controversial. Although apparently it is. <laughs> apparently, according to the uh, main, some mainstream viewpoints, which I find surprising, but anyways. Okay, so he lays out a few different types of family structures, and I don't think we should... At least the way I was reading it is like, I don't think this is necessarily an exhaustive list of all the different type of family structures that have existed. I mean, that seems way too broad sweeping. Of course, uh, Engels was basing most of this work on the book by Lewis Morgan uh, called Ancient Society, which was mostly based off of um, his studies of a couple different um, American Indian tribes. So the sample size is not super broad. Um, although in the book, again, Engels does look at like Greek, Rome, uh, and like Germanic societies as well for examples. So, I mean, there's more than one source here, but again, the body of data that he's drawing upon is uh, limited. So I'll just put that out there. This is not exhaustive, but there's at least a few different types of families that have been demonstrated, either either by deduction or by uh, direct observation. So the first one and the oldest mode of the family that he lays out is the consanguine family, and I think that literally just means in Latin, like, same blood or something. Um, and that's pretty much what it sounds like. So the marriage groups are like the pool of people that marry each other. And it, a lot of times it would have been group marriage or like it may not have had a formal marriage in the sense. Um, but anyways, the groups would have been just purely based on generations. And this would have been in the context of like small tribes or bands and clans and so forth long ago. Um, so basically what, when it says different generations, that basically means that like all of the adults would be like hooking up and they'd be all polyamorous with each other essentially and then th all of their children it's like the next generation would all do the same thing but that didn't preclude things like incest from happening or so 
whether it be like cousins or siblings, that could totally happen. I don't know how frequent that was, but if you go back long enough, it seems like that would have been basically uh, a necessary stage to have happened at some point, even if it didn't last very long. Um, which brings us to the Punaluan family, which essentially the main change here, the main shift is the elimination of those ancestral relationships. So that means that, you know, taboos and customs get started that eliminate, you know, siblings, especially um, siblings from the same mother. And we'll kind of get into mother right in a little bit. Um, But really, when it comes to parentage at this time in history, you could only be sure of your mother. You weren't you didn't really know who your father was almost at all because like that first quote I talked uh, I showed mentioned um, you know if the men are poly- polygamous and the women are polyandrous meaning like multiple men it essentially just means everyone was like poly everyone was hooking up with everyone else there wasn't like much rhyme or rhythm to it and that means tracking who got who pregnant would have been very difficult um, and, but you could be sure of who gave birth to you. That would have been a, a surefire thing, um, which is kind of why matrilineal uh, things got started. But yeah, Punaluan, basically, it's pretty similar, but now we're not doing incest anymore. Um, although I, I we talked about this last week just a little bit, but it is kind of funny that. You know, Engels writes about this is like, oh, they eliminated incest. Isn't that great? But it's like, I'm pretty sure like Charles Darwin, like married his cousin, his first cousin. And he was a contemporary with Engels. So it's like, clearly some things stuck around. (laughs) That's kind of an interesting thing. Um, Incest is kind of subjective over cultures. I mean, obviously in the West, we think having, you know, your cousin as your wife is really bad. And it's there's a lot of evidence that it is. Um, but if you do look throughout all cultures, one of the few like commonalities is that they all actually have an incest taboo. Like incest, uh, especially among siblings, is very, very looked down upon in all cultures. However, um, what is defined as family is different uh, depending on the culture. Yeah. And I, like I said, I think at least what he suggests in the text is basically like, like I said, they could definitely keep track of the children of a given woman. So they knew for a fact, like, okay, this group of children came from this mother. Let's make sure that this group of children does not hook up with themselves. That that much they can keep track of. Um, they could probably keep track of, like, first cousins pretty easily if that were taboo. Um, I think once you get to second cousins, it might get trickier, <laughs> um, especially because you can't, like, you're only tracking mothers right so it's like hard to I don't know it could be tricky once you get past first cousin I guess and going out further into the tree or whatever but yeah they could definitely track siblings pretty easily pretty much since the beginning and so yeah that that eventually became taboo in virtually every society all right next is oh good second cousins or base was basically an an inviolable thing because you have so small of a group that you basically cannot marry anyone if you're gonna take the third or the fourth uh, cousin. Yeah, and I think I think you're right that that would have been more of an issue, or I think that's part of the pro- like that's what caused sort of the consanguine family. Uh, is that you had really small groups of people. Um, and like some of the evidence they point to for that is the Polynesian communities and especially Hawaii, because you can imagine in that scenario, right, that when the original people like arrived in Hawaii, it was probably like a couple families, a couple clans or whatever. But it couldn't have been, like, a ton. 
I don't know. I don't know the numbers. I'm sure someone has made an estimate, but I mean, just think about it, right? Let's say like four families show up on Hawaii originally, right? I don't know what the real number is. Just go with me. I mean, that's that is a very small starting population. <laughs> I don't know how many are in each family. You know, I'm sure it will depend, but it's like inbreeding and and some incest is almost inevitable, but. I think once you kind of branch out a little bit um, and get your population starts growing, it's probably it becomes less and less of an issue over time. Um, and then, like, eventually you can start forbidding siblings uh, and so forth as your population size grows. But I think those are pretty niche examples, like, like I said, in the Polynesian islands, be- because they're islands. I mean, some people had to go from the main like from mainland asia and travel by boat out to those islands and you know it's not unreasonable to assume that that did not happen in enormous groups it was probably happening in like small groups at a time and those small groups had limited options <laughs> with with mating partners so uh, that sort of that's where you might see this type of uh, family situation uh, originating like i said look at your material conditions and, and deduce from there. Um, okay. Number three on the list is the pairing family. So this is sort of the earliest instance of what I just nicknamed like one at a time pairings of men and women, uh, either and, and either member can terminate the relationship or they can terminate it mutually in some situations. Uh, mother right is still around at this point. Although private property is on the rise during this period. Um, And men are in in a lot of cultures, and I'm sure this would totally depend on which culture you're looking at. But in some places, it it would be more common, I should say, to find men are still allowed to be polygamous. Um, But you're starting to see more restrictions on women being uh, polyandrous or you know, polyamorous, whatever. Um, and it's interesting. I think he mentions that, like, uh, they kind of deduce that this would have actually been implemented by the women in these client, like tribes and so forth. Um, and I think the idea is actually just like I was talking about. So if you had, if you started with just a couple families initially, and they breed like with one another over time. Your population balloons. Now, if you if you have a taboo saying like, okay, cousins are not allowed to hook up ever. Okay. Um, eventually, you're gonna have like a shit ton of people that are cousins, right? I mean, event. That's the deep. That's what's gonna happen. Is everyone's gonna be fucking cousins at some point? Um, And at some point, you're going to have to start marrying, like, outside the tribe and just get fresh blood, basically, in order to, like, maintain those taboos. Um, And so that's where you start seeing, like, the merging of, like, different clans and tribes into, like, bigger, much bigger groups of people. Um, And that tends to be less polygamous and more... Uh, like like I said, I said one at a time, meaning like it's not monogamy in the sense that um, you can always just leave your partner if they're not doing it for you. You just, okay, I'm done with this. Bye. <laughs> like, get, I'm going to find someone else basically. Um, but, but you would have like, it was more common to have like one partner at a time. I guess that, that is what the big shift is here. Uh, and like I said, this sort of correlates with the beginning of private property um, as the productive forces begin to grow and, and develop. They continue to develop, especially when agriculture and livestock become more commonly uh, cultivated. Uh, and then finally, we have the monogamous family, which is parallel in its development with private property 
And this is a more like strict form of monogamy where you have one pairing basically for life. Although I did include here that, or I, sorry, I didn't include here that um, even in monogamous relationships, it's still historically is still usually men can still be polygamous, but women are completely forbidden. Um, but the main impetus towards the monogamous family here or the nuclear family, if you like, it has to do with basically guaranteeing one pairing for life in order for property owning males to guarantee heirs for their inheritance. Um, so once you have private property, you have stuff to pass down to an heir, right? But think about it. If you are operating under a mother right system, which actually, you know what? I'm going to say that because I think we'll get there. Um, Okay, one more slide on monogamy. We'll get to mother right in a minute. And what happened to it. Um, okay, so on monogamy really fast. So again, just to reiterate for the liberals and the walls, monogamy developed historically, and it is not the natural way of things, quote unquote. Okay? Let's just make sure everyone's on the same page there. Um, and like most things it's a social relation social construct it doesn't have to be that way uh, it just developed that way as a consequence of the property relations that developed alongside of it okay uh, so let me read this quote <clears throat> um, all right it says lately it has become fashionable to deny the existence of this initial stage in human sexual life humanity must be spared the shame it is pointed out that all direct proof of such stage is lacking, and particular appeal is made to evidence from the rest of the am animal world. For even among animals, according to the numerous facts collected by random French dude, complete promiscuity in sexual intercourse marks a low stage of development. But the only conclusion I can draw from all these facts, so far as man and his primitive conditions of life are concerned, is that they prove nothing whatever. So... If you ever see an individual claiming that the social behavior of lobsters is an indication of how humans should behave, maybe you say, I don't care. That doesn't prove anything <laughs> because they're fucking lobsters. And draw spits in their face. Yeah, maybe share some lobster with them. Preferably pre chewed lobster. What if they talk about rats instead? Ooh. You know what? We can make an exception for rats. Rats are upstanding no, comrades. You, I'm just you, kidding. <laughs> you chew a rat's head off, and then you spit it on them. Like a real man. Yeah, that'll show them. <clears throat> but, yeah. Um, it's a good point, right? Because this sort of appeal to nature which I don't know if it's a formal logical fallacy but it should be if it isn't um, look just because some creature in the natural world does something some social behavior or anti-social behavior whatever does not mean humans either ought to be doing that should be doing that or like are you know biologically must do this thing this is a total fucking fallacy right I, I think the example he brings up is actually actually let me uh, where is it uh, do you know that there is ketchup that shit and uh, eat from the same hole do you really want to be doing that this is nature Um, wait, what? I, I didn't hear the first part of that. What, what was that? You know that there's creatures that eat and shit from the same hole. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Um, oh boy, what page was it on? Hold on. I want to find this because he had a really funny, a funny, um, 
retort to the argument of like, oh, just look at the other animals and what they do. That's what the humans should be doing. I think it's like 20 something. Okay, yeah, here we go. Um, okay, this is actually right after this quote I, I put in the slide. So he says, um, that vertebrates mate together for a considerable period is sufficiently explained by physiological causes. In the case of birds, for example, by the female's need of help during the brooding period. The examples of faithful monogamy among birds prove nothing about humans for the simple reason that humans are not descended from birds. And if strict monogamy is the height of all virtue, then the palm must go to the tapeworm, which has a complete set of male and female sexual organs in which each of its 50 to 200 proglottides or sections and spends its whole life copulating in all its sections with itself. <laughs> I, I love that response. I mean, it's so good. Like if you ever hear someone tell you like oh tell you. monogamy is is the way like that's how we should be doing things oh one man one woman just be like oh so like like tapeworms they just basically well, the fuck it's themselves and br br that's how they reproduce <laughs> anyways I thought it was funny but obviously it it's a good point like I said, it's, or I should say, it's basically just a fallacy. If, if someone's like, oh, this one creature does one thing, just be like, yeah, I don't care. That's the easiest response to most of those is just, I don't give a shit. Okay. I'll go kill no. All right. Um, next point I wanted to put in here, and this is actually from the uh, Leacock book, The Myth of Male Dominance. I think I put that PDF in the, um, yeah, I don't, did I pin it? Probably not. Uh, I can pin it in a minute, but it's actually, just scroll up a little bit in the chat, um, and you'll see the Eleanor, Eleanor Burke Leacock Myths of Male Dominance PDF for anyone to check it out. Um, it is one of the recommended readings, but she had a good note in here that I just wanted to kind of bring up here, um... Again, I think it's good to distinguish from, like, let's be honest, mostly liberal framing. Uh, so she says that uh, she prefers autonomy to equality, for equality connotes rights and opportunities specific to class society and confuses similarity with equity. Strictly speaking, who can be or wants to be equal to anyone else? That makes sense. And then furthermore, she says, in the case of foraging societies, the control women exercise over their own lives and activities is widely, if not fully, accepted as ethnographic fact. So, um, yeah, I mean, just kind of, again, highlighting the old ways of doing things. Um, sort of were better for, for women pretty much in every case, which is kind of sad. All right, next we'll get into mother right so the first thing and actually the funny that I actually grabbed this right from the text even Engels brings this up is that it's kind of a misnomer um because mother right is not a legal term so right isn't the right word for it I guess you could say um and but really what we're referring to here like I mentioned earlier is the tracking of parentage through the mother or matrilineage this is of course in contrast to patrilineage which is how things are done in a lot of societies today um, so like you know you it's it's very common to see like people you see like a, a woman like take her husband's last name for example and they're children take the like, husband's last name so so on and so forth so that would be patrilineage so matrilineage would be the opposite where I mean last names are not you're basically tracking your lineage through your mother because like I said back in the day when you didn't have the means of keeping track of who your parents were 
um, mostly through social customs, really, or and just sexual practices like of polygamy you didn't, or polyamory. You didn't really know who was knocking up who. So the only way to be sure who your parents were was who gave birth to you. That's a pretty easy thing to keep track of. Um, and, yeah, so early on, um, a lot humans were mostly polyamorous. Um, fatherhood was very difficult to track. And it, just a quick note also on sort of inheritance. So really early on, there wouldn't really have been anything to inherit because most things would have been owned in common regardless. But if once you get to like a slightly higher stage where you do have a little bit of a surplus within the family, maybe you have some heads of cattle uh, or like a small patch of land with a farm or something like that, you know, something you can pass on to your offspring. Even then, um, you wouldn't, a man wouldn't pass that down to his children. Because first of all, he probably didn't even know who his kids were. He might be like, ah, maybe I have kids. I mean, it's possible. Um, but instead, if, when he dies, what they would do is they would look at his sister um, and give it to her kids instead. And if he didn't have sisters, then they would go up the chain to his, I guess, aunt and or like his f first cousins uh, who are female and give it to their so basically giving it to his nephews and niece or I should say nieces and nephews. Um, so anyways, yeah, like they would basically go back up the matrilineal line until they found someone to give their stuff to. Um, so, yeah, um, that's matrilineage in a nutshell. But and I also put in here that uh, even in group marriages, you still had matrilineal uh, practices. And um, the other thing that they talk about in the text quite a bit is that the the practice of matrilineage tended to result in organiz like societal organizations where you had groups of women actually in decision, basically in like the main primary decision making roles. So whether that be like, you know, councils or kind of wise women elders so on and so forth like basically you had groups of women who called the shots pretty much um, and that's because there was a a lot of respect for people's mothers and like I said you could know for sure who your mother was so I mean there's at least a shred of respect for your mother um, but it did it, it afforded them a uh, a pretty esteemed position in their societies uh, and which is contrary to what uh, the dominant social practice was when Engels was writing this of course uh, and so he, he's constantly bringing that up um, as a big difference between you know matrilineal and patrilineal society yeah and just to make sure that everyone is on the same page with us here um, the historical context that we're talking about is the uh, what you would call the earliest forms of society, like the first um, nomad tribes and the uh, first uh, agricultural uh, societies. Yeah, this is what they refer to as prehistory. So, in other words, pre-written history. Um, so, yeah, the most advanced form of development, or like, a, a, sorry, not development, um, the productive capacity would have been like hunting, hunting and gathering. Um, I did skip the section in the beginning where he lays out the like different stages of prehistory, like savagery, barbarism, and civilization. On one hand, the naming, the nomenclature is kind of cringe and is super outdated because a lot of the, that terminology got appropriated by racists, uh, <coughs> the British, <coughs> uh, to justify oh, colonization. <laughs> um, even though Engels is trying to subvert that stuff, I mean, to be fair, um, he actually sort of, he is pushing back against like 
oh, like, you know, us Brits should, you know, go spread coloni- uh, colonization, spread civilization to the, uh, to the unwashed masses or whatever. Um, yeah, he is pushing back against that, but it, I, I'm also pretty sure there's actually... Oh, okay, like, so the developments he lays out, like, the, you know, different stages of, like, hunting technology, so you've got, like, you know, at first you're looking at, like, clubs and spears, which are minimally effective, and then you've got, like, once you get to, like, bows and arrows, and those are, like, much more effective, and then you've got, eventually you'll figure out metal tools at some point, and, you know, so, yes, there is, like, a progression in, like, weapons and different hunting techniques, different agriculture, like early, early agriculture. Um, they're slowly figuring yeah. this stuff out. So, but to me, I, I don't know about y'all, but like what it seems like from my reading is I don't even think it's, I don't actually see the benefit to like breaking that into stages. You know what I mean? Cause it yeah. seems like a more fluid development. And I, I don't know how you could universify. I don't know if that's a word, but or universalize that's a, that is a word universalize like that progression f- across the world right because well, uh, you, 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 can, you can do that in uh, one way which is uh, so there is inventions that lead to other inventions right so you go the age of like using stone tools the age of the wheel which is a really big invention the age of uh, finding copper, the age of finding iron. This is the only like actual viable way to break this down into stages because we roughly made this, uh, did these things in the same pattern. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also mm. where like names like Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age come from. Is the yeah, referencing I need what to the tools are made of pretty sure i need to go soon but i did want to briefly mention something so first and foremost most of what we here is actually um kind of subjective like uh, the mother right not all cultures of course have that but uh, an even bigger thing is the claim that uh, humans were largely polyamorous at, at any stage in prehistory we don't know that um but uh, one other thing about this uh the idea of labeling things through like ages is that um even then, it's kind of a misnomer fairly often. Uh, for example, Native Americans around the Great Lakes at one point were like the best metal workers uh, in the world uh, because of natural copper deposits. Um, and uh, if you look at other cultures, such as the uh, Mayans, they had a very sophisticated society despite technically being in the Stone Age. So even then, it's very negligible to uh, see these sort of ages as a sign of progression. Um, but yeah. I, I have to go have a good one, everyone. All right. Yep. Take care. Yep. No, I generally agree with that. Um, if there's one thing that we can take away from historical materialism, it's that um, development is insanely uneven based on geography and a whole nother, a whole bunch of factors. Climate. Ge- I mean, that's maybe that falls under the umbrella of geography, I guess, but. There's a lot of factors that uh, go into like all material conditions. It is yes, ultimately it is a, a material conditions thing, right? Because I mean, imagine you're in a region where there aren't easily accessible uh, metal deposits. Like those people would probably never even probably never even fucking heard of metal. They're like, what are you talking about? You know, like stone is as good as it gets. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, yeah. it just depends. It totally depends on where you are. And not just when you are, but like where you are and when you are there. Because if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, like you don't have the right technology, you could be in the, sorry, I'm basically saying you could be in the right place with the wrong technology. Um, yes, yes. And so on and so forth. So there's a lot of reasons why that, those stages of development are, to me, don't seem super useful. I mean, it's interesting, like, we can still learn from, like, the, what's it called, the, uh, oh, I'm getting feedback from someone, I can't tell what it is, but, um, there's, oh, oh okay, oh, you can pipe in just one second, so I was just gonna say, um, 
Yes, uneven geographical development, but also like very uneven technological development, I guess. I'll just leave it there. I, uh, I also think that we kind of agreed last week that this definitely has sort of a Eurocentric effect to it, um, for better or worse, just by the fact that he discusses uh, Native peoples in the Americas. This, that perspective is still fairly European. Yes, and another thing is that they might have the right technology and the enough resources, but they just didn't need it. Like, if they just didn't need something, why would they do it, you know? Like, for example, there was no good use of wheels in, in the Americas because they didn't have uh, cattle that is domesticated and uh, large enough to um, carry uh, uh, what do you call it the, the wood cars things wagons. Uh, so yeah wagons so like yeah material conditions in general yeah and you know it's also funny too because like even in the um like, if you look at the Incans in the Andes Mountains and so forth, they had, like, some of the best roads in the world in, like, in, like, the most extreme environment in the Americas, like, up in the Andes Mountains, which are, I think, the second highest mountain range after the Himalayas, if I'm not mistaken. And, yeah, like, I, don't, I still don't, I don't think they had wheels. Not a single wheel. <laughs> anywhere they just had super badass roads that were so easy to traverse on foot that like who needs wheels <laughs> you know and I mean obviously they you bring up a good point which is that they didn't have I think the only livestock they had were llamas which are not exactly like hauling like, you could put saddlebags on a llama and just like walk it around but that's the point you your llama you just put saddlebags on it kind of like a camel you put like a bunch of bags and shit on a camel and it'll just walk through the sand. You're not going to like roll a wagon through like desert sand. That's pretty much impossible. You're going to need like pretty hard ground this to do that. Because, uh, this is obviously racist because I'm not up. Beware of from this guy. He's racist. Well, anyways. My point is, yes, depending on what kind of animals you have around and the terrain, your use of wheels may vary dramatically, is what I'm getting at. Um, and it totally depends. I mean, that's the thing. Like, <laughs> even if you do, like, like, the Mayans or Aztecs, like, they had, they could easily make wheels um, and circular things. Like, I mean, I don't know if any of you have seen, like, the... Um, those Mayan uh, ball courts where it's sort of like oh. an ancient form of basketball, basically. But, they but, had toys that looked like vaguely like cars with wheels in them. Like they had a lot of toys with wheels in them. Yeah, Because, totally. you know, kids can push it around, you know? Like, they yeah. understood that this is something that can happen, but, like, they don't have anything, anything to uh, drag it with. And I think I am not really sure if uh, uh, I can find the source later. I'm going to send it to you. That they had some kind of a wagon that was, like, so small that, like, a person, a normal person can just drag it with them. Yeah. Um, uh, but, like, there is not much evidence about it because uh, it was made from wood. But I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I think that's a good. I don't know. I, I think that's fine, uh, leaving it there. Because I mean, yes, there's no reason to believe that they didn't like know. I mean, shit, they made like their whole calendar circular. <laughs> um, of course, they knew what circles and wheels were, but they just didn't. They didn't use them in production, right? They didn't need it. They're like, yeah, whatever, we're good. 
another thing is that they didn't have um, wheat, which that's uh, true. They had maize. You, yeah, and you need wheels to uh, make um, uh, flour. What do you call it? The white powder flour. Yes. Yep. Yeah. You have um, to grind wheat well, and kernels into flour, mm -hmm. but you don't need. I mean, you could. I mean, you you can ground corn kernels into uh, corn meal, but you could do that by hand. Yeah, you can do that by and hand pretty it. easily, or you can just cook corn on the cob as is and just eat it straight exactly. off the cob. Yeah, exactly. It saves you a lot of power, man. Like, yeah, corn and maize is uh, is a pretty op crop. All right. And they could also eat popcorn. Fun fact. There is actually, I'm pretty sure there has been like documented evidence of uh, popcorn making in uh, ancient Mexican societies. Very cool. We, we need to stop uh, Mayan worshipping, uh, ancient societies worshipping uh, soon. Why is that? We have a whole book. I need to go to work soon. Oh, okay. All right, we'll, we'll get on with it. All right. Um, well, you might be thinking that with all this mother right around in ancient societies and so forth, um, what happened to it? Why is it no longer around? It's incredibly uncommon these days. Well, um, Engels proposes that private property is the problem typical communists blaming everything on private property but that is how it be um, so um, he says according to the division of labor within the family at that time it was the man's part to obtain food and the instruments of labor necessary for the purpose uh, oh I think I left that unfinished quote alright well I think it's purpose of survival or something like that um Anyways, therefore, according to the social custom of the time, the man was also the owner of the new sources of subsistence, the cattle, and later the new instruments of labor, the slaves. So, right, we're starting to get into the earliest forms of class society, aka, which obviously coincides with the emergence of private property. But according to the custom of the same society, his children could not inherit from him. Mother right, therefore, had to be overthrown, and overthrown it was. So now we see the problem here with mother right. Like I said, if you are a guy and you own some cattle or slaves or farmland or whatever, and you want to pass it on to a child to inherit it from you, you were shit out of luck because you didn't know who the mother, you couldn't really be sure who the mother of your children were or who your children were at all. So it got passed down to your sister's children or cousin's children or whatever. So, um, basically, as private property emerged and there was a need, a, a basically a social, uh, there was a lacking social relation of like, oh, we need to pass this down to our offspring, um, that sort of flipped the script. Um, and that's where the, it, well, I should also mention, that as men began accumulating more private property um, especially in the forms of you might say the means of production right or the means of subsistence um, they began to hold more consider considerable sway over you know the whatever group they're in um, in fact let me see do I have this oh boy I don't know if I'm going to be able to find this quote in the... I don't remember if I put it in here or not. Okay, no, I didn't. I forgot. Um, well, anyways, I think in the Leacock book, she mentioned... Oh, man, where was it? Wait, I'm so close to it. Hold on. 
Decision making in foraging society. Okay, wait, here we go. Okay, uh, this is from Lee Cox's book. This is uh, on the same time. So it says, it is not generally recognized, however, that the direct relation between production and consumption was intimately connected with the dispersal of authority. Unless some form of control over resources enables persons with authority to withhold them from others, authority is not authority as we know it. So think about it. If you're the one in control of the resources and how they get distributed to people, you can wield authority over them. Right? That's, that's the, that is literally the basis of private property. Is I'm withholding this thing or this stuff from everyone else. And they have to give me something in return for that stuff or for the use of that stuff. That is the fundamental, I mean, you know, the shorthand of like private property is fundamentally theft is kind of true. You are withholding something from someone else and making them do something for you in return to access it. That, you know, that's, that's basically what prop, private property is at its most basic form. And this is where you can exercise an authority over someone, control over other people controlling resources that they need to survive. And this is where, when this develops, this sort of private property develops, that gives men the ability to wield that authority over others, especially the women in their lives, and they can be like, hey, um, like, I'm going to need you to, like, only marry me and have only my children from now on because I need someone to pass my shit on to. In return, I'll give you what you need to survive. I mean, it's a pretty raw deal, but what other choice is there? Another thing we should uh, have in mind when discussing this period is that the men were tasked usually by uh, hunting. Therefore, they had weapons, while um, most men didn't even have weapons to uh, defend themselves from um, the private property owners. You, you, you take your better uh, to the uh, uh, current society and say nothing. I think that's, that might, yeah, I, I can see how that might be true. Although I think this, the development of private property is more closely related to agriculture and animal husbandry. Um, so the well, yeah, yeah. But, but still, the, the thing having uh, the primary thing having changed that um, men at this period still had uh, the weapons, while the women didn't. This is why uh, it is. Um, I mean, I think necessary. that's true, but like, I'm not sure. I'm not. What I'm missing is like, what would be stopping women from just getting weapons, like just making their own? Uh, I mean. <laughs> because because this is a, they can't make them because the uh, property to make weapons, the capital to make weapons is a private property uh, for a man with weapons. Yeah, I guess eventually that would have been privatized, yeah. I don't know, it's tough. I get, uh, obviously... That uh, like I, like I was mentioning that authority right a second ago. Obviously, that authority doesn't necessarily need to be enforced by like an individual upon another individual. Um, but it'd be more like <laughs> you would give access. I mean, you could literally just hire guards or hire like or or shit i mean if you own if you have slaves like you could just give them them weapons and be like okay you guys are defending my property now like <laughs> as my property as well like yeah it's kind of twisted but like that's that's kind of the point right is it like the development of private property as a social construct is just an incredibly violent process <laughs> basically um 
and it really fucks with the uh, the whole the whole vibe of the situation back then. Um, that, to be honest, sounds like it was. You know, it would have been tough to survive, but at least it sounds like everyone would have been pretty chill. But once private property gets introduced, a whole bunch of mess of problems start popping up. So go figure. Someone should abolish private property. That'd be nice. All right. Next. Um... So this is where Engels mentions, or he's kind of drawing some parallels between monogamy and class oppression. Um, So he says, the first class oppression that appears in history coincides with the development of the antagonism between man and woman and monogamous marriage. And the first class oppression coincides with that of the female sex by the male. Monogamous marriage was a great historical step forward, nonetheless, or sorry, nevertheless, together with slavery and private wealth, it opens the period that has lasted until today, which he's referring to class society, in which every step forward is also relatively a step backward, in which prosperity and development for some is won through the misery and frustration of others. It is a cellular form of civilized, civilized society, in which the nature of the oppositions and contradictions fully active in that society can already be studied. So he's drawing a thread from this uh, development in the family all the way to the modern day that, you know, um, these developments kind of all were parallel to one another and you can still see it working its magic to this day in quote-unquote civilized society. And, you know, specifically... Of course, he's talking about class society now. So we sort of, at this point in the text, we sort of graduated from prehistory into the earliest, um, like the earliest modes of civilization that have written history and agriculture, and they're starting to get more developed. But that's also when class society begins to develop as a result, right? Because now, I mean, think about it, right? So prehistory humans had virtually no surplus or a very very small surplus maybe enough to feed like the elders who are too old to contribute and and their children like yeah you get in like the adults have enough of a surplus to feed their offspring obviously but uh, and they're old and sick and infirmed but uh, beyond that no you didn't really have any surplus right you were basically living hand to mouth um, you would have to constantly hunt, gather, or cultivate in order to feed everybody. Um, But once you start getting agriculture and animal husbandry more established, you greatly increase the number of resources you can collect on a yearly basis. So now you can start getting more of a surplus. What happens to that surplus? Who decides what happens to it? Um, That's, I mean, this is what happens. So it happens. It just so happens, basically, in the history of how this all happened, <laughs> that men tended to be the ones in charge of um, collecting that surplus and distributing it, and they used that authority to uh, dominate women, essentially, and um, establish classes, and and that also established um, the first. Or the earliest, I guess it wouldn't be the second earliest, let's say, stage of economy being slavery. Because uh, they could start hiring people to fight on their behalf and then go capture other people and be like, all right, you work for me now and uh, I own you and so forth. Um, so, yeah, with class society comes a bunch of misery, as he says in this quote. Um, Misery for most and prosperity for a couple of people. So, yeah. Um, I'm guessing this text probably inadvertently spawned, like, anarcho-primitivist people. <laughs> but Or maybe there's another anarchist anthropology text I'm not aware of that did the same thing. But, yeah. That's kind of... It's hard... It's It's, like, easy to see that argument coming through this text uh, if you just read it through that lens of like oh man civilization was a mistake 
We should all go back to hunting and gathering. But alas, there is an issue. Because now we have the state. And as we learned in the state and revolution, the state and private property are best buddies throughout history. In fact, they came about pretty much right alongside each other. So uh, Engels says only one thing was wanting, and this is want, uh, wanting from the perspective of a property owner. An institution which not only secured the newly acquired riches of individuals against the communistic traditions of the Gentile order, so the Gentile order being like the previous, you know, more primitive organization, uh, a prehistorical one, which not only sanctified the private property formerly so little valued and declared this sanctification to be the highest purpose of all human society, but an institution which set the re seal of general social recognition on each new method of acquiring property and thus amassing wealth at continually increasing speed. An institution which perpetuated not only this growing cleavage of society into classes, but also the right of the possessing class to exploit the non-possessing and the rule of the former over the latter. At the end, this institution came. The state was invented. So this is what the state is for and this is why it came about because the property classes the or he calls it the possessing class they were amassing more and more wealth and you know it's you kind of have this issue with this thing like communism where if you acquire a shit ton of riches at the expense of everyone around you they kind of fucking hate your guts so in order to protect yourself and your wealth, you need bodies of armed people or armed men to defend your stuff and yourself from the non-possessing class because they're probably going to be pissed at you. Um, and thus, that's the origin of the state. It's pretty straightforward. As soon as you have private property, you need a way of defending it from other people. And so there's your there's your solution. Easy, right? Well yeah, like in the state is the I think the easiest concept in this book. Uh, because it is a, a pretty straightforward kind of thing, right? Uh, no state, private property, there is a need for state uh, state in whatever uh, form it is. Uh, therefore, there will be a state just to protect the private property. I agree. It, it should. It sounds. I agree with this formulation. I mean, it makes sense to me. However, um, as I understand it, and I don't have the full details, but as I understand it, there are anarchist theorists that actually disagree with this. Uh, I think they suggest that the state sort of has always been around in some form or another um, I'm not sure well, about that depends on, it depends on your definition because um, probably yeah it, yeah because when you define the state as a tool of class oppression uh, specifically it's gonna be way different than when you define it as um, an institution, a social and or economic institution that upholds oppression. Yeah, you could even well, make it more broad and just say like social control, right? So even like yeah. even like religious practices or traditions yeah. or like uh, taboos, like taboo thing, any of those taboo things. things can be defined. Right. Uh, as a state, if you're. Uh, yeah, they're if all you're like methods of like social that. control. It's basically like they're all ways of controlling people's behavior. Even even morality, yeah. like even morality, is a way of controlling social behavior, right? By defining which things are the right thing to do and which things are the wrong thing to do, right? Even morality is a social control. But 
Does that make it a state? I don't know about that. <laughs> That's where I would fall off hard yeah. with that. I would disagree. Yeah, I am not going to. Uh, so social control is needed, but I think a better way to approach morality is a personal morality in which like everyone gets their own personal code of morals, no universal that you um, disagree with. Uh, you're going to uh, be the taboo one that nobody's uh, allowed to talk to, you know? I, I do. No, I mean, yeah. I guess I won't go any further um, on the whole anarchist anthropology. I, I think David Graeber had a book on it. Um, that's the reference I came across that someone mentioned like David Graeber's viewpoint on these things is, is quite different but I don't know what those viewpoints are so I won't even bother right now yeah. alright um, back to the nuclear family so this is I think a little more uh, we're getting into this idea of the family of the as the basic unit economic unit of society uh, so he says the distinction of rich um, and poor we, oh go ahead before, before we get in, um, into that uh, in this case in this uh, stage of uh, historical development the private property is not different than the state the private property is the state the person with the most private property is the king god, the chosen one. Uh, just trying to clarify, like, oh, the yeah, state yeah. of development. Agreed, yeah. And, and that's the thing. I think you would have... I mean, you can you can pretty easily imagine, like, if you have a access to a ton of resources, uh, or and not just access, but, like, you control them... Um, like how is that control enforced well it's it's just enforced by like people who can kill other people <laughs> pretty much this is the only way to actually enforce anything really is is by is by force well yeah but the thing here is that um in, in these societies the top class the owning class were like hey i can fight you now get a bigger army kill you and kill all of your family and take your wealth or and like spend most of my wealth and risk my subjects revolting against me or you can just enroll in the new government that I just made up and I'm gonna make you a duke or something in, in this point <clears throat> the state and the private property are not that different uh, but while you go further, you're going to see restriction, uh, restri restrictions popping up. And these restrictions uh, are going to separate the state from the private property. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think that would also probably coincide with like the scaling up of these various civilizations from like you know villages and towns with like a couple hundred maybe even a couple thousand people to like seriously large cities like you know tens of thousands I think once you get yeah. to that scale like that's where a state would um, would be required by the property classes in order to like secure their holdings um, well, and so forth like, there is there is like uh, when you look at uh, tribal um, uh, factions uh, I'm, I'm taking examples of the Arab world because I know that um, they act like a state they uphold an unspoken of law like a state and they uh, communicate with each other and uh, solve issues like states in which they uh, sit down, uh, have chai, 
uh, casually uh, while talking about the issue, solve the issue and then eat food. And this is the sign of the agreements between those two unspoken of states uh, that have just formed from the need for state. Well, why is there a need for a state? Well, uh, there is a class struggle between the elders of the uh, tribe and the uh, other tribe members in which the elder tribe members have most of the private property while the youngers are working for them and uh, women have absolutely nothing. Um, this uh, triclassical uh, triclass uh, 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 appearance to a tribe would make it a state even though it is an unspoken of state. So it is kind of an example about it. Yeah, no, I think that's a good example too. The other one I just thought of is, you know, um, once you do start instituting um, slavery as your economic institution, typically people don't go into slavery voluntarily. So you're going to have to coerce them somehow. Um, and you, I, I, I'm sure a pretty good way of doing that historically was at the tip of a spear or sword or something like that, right? I mean, that's that seems like the obvious way to make people into slaves is to force them to do it. Yeah. Well, so. uh, a, a kind of slavery we have here is if you were into debt with somebody, you would be their slave basically for a, a period of time until you pay back your debt any fixed amount of time that uh, has been agreed to. But who enforces the debt payment? The person who enforces the debt, debt payment is the state, which is the tribal elders. Well, the thing is, yep, the go. tribal elders haven't haven't made wealth uh, because when they were young they were just like a, a, every other tribe member just uh, a young worker right mm -hmm. when they get older their parents die off uh, so they get rich therefore they be the state as I said it is non separate uh, you cannot separate the state from the uh, ruling, uh, from the uh, oligarchical uh, class at this uh, uh, point. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is kind of complicated. Most of the young generations don't live up, uh, don't live enough to be part of the elders. Therefore, they are a small uh, uh, minority that controls large amount of wealth that they make others work for, uh, uh, work using, uh, therefore accumulating wealth, their wealth without working. Yeah, no, I think that tracks. It's like a super early form of, of because they're, they're fulfilling, like you said, they're fulfilling all the functions of a state, even if it's not what we might recognize as a state. I mean, it's interesting. Well, and this thing is like, uh, has been going in the uh, Arab world like since, since we know of it, right? Uh, this was the, as we recognized that the way that things function and they functioned, uh, so the Arab world is divided, right? There is the uh, region of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, parts, small parts of Iraq, uh, small parts of Jordan, and uh, the lowercase uh, states there. 
and there is the Mesopotamia, Al Sham, and um, Egypt. The difference between those is that uh, the first ones uh, did not have the ability to start agriculture in most of the land for its being a desert. Therefore, they needed the uh, structure of a tribe to uh, manifestate the private property, while the upper the other uh, section had enough ability to start agriculture. So, uh, throughout that, people uh, uh, made cities, uh, small villages, then cities, then large cities that went into uh, 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 hundreds of thousands uh, of members. And uh, in that, there was what you would call people who were managing the farming. These people, basically, were the people who make the rules, right? So they were, in, 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 in the start of it, just uh, uh, the person who knows uh, more about it or the person who is elder about it, right? And then with the manifestation of time and their ability to uh, make rules, they instead served uh, the people into serfdom, uh, therefore being an owning class. And there was three kinds of property. There was the privately owned property uh, in which uh, large owners uh, made sure that they uh, 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 say that their uh, loyalty is for the king, so the king cannot uh, uh, crush them with an army. There was the public property, property, and this is important. At this stage, there is still public property, but the difference is that the public property was casually, usually sabotaged by private property. So private property can control this property later on and or was poorly managed because the best people were uh, working in private properties uh, for the obvious reason of a way fucking higher pay. Uh, because in uh, public properties, everything is shared equally. Uh, while in uh, uh, private properties, if you're from the managerial class, you would get way more for your same work. And there was, of course, the um, uh, property that belonged to the king and the... Uh, uh, religious rulers, but this is like kind of the same thing. All right. Well, thank you for that example. It's pretty interesting. Also goes to show that, like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, a lot of the stuff that is presented in this book is not... There are parallels, I think you can find, but everything is going to be a little bit different uh, across the board. Okay, uh, let me read this real quick. I uh, only got two more slides. So, the distinction of the rich and poor appears beside that of freeman and slave. With the new division of labor, a new cleavage of society into classes. The inequalities of property among the individual heads of families break up the old communal household for communities wherever they had still managed to survive, and with them, the common cultivation of the soil by and for these communities. The cultivated land is the allotted for use to single families, at first temporarily, and then later permanently. The transition to full private property is gradually accomplished, parallel with the transition of the pairing marriage into monogamy. The single family is becoming the economic unit of society. All right. All right, next. Um, this, is where, this is the end of the book where he's talking about quote-unquote civilization. 
is as now for the first time a class of peers, which, without in any way participating in production, captures the direction of production as a whole and economically subjugates the producers. That's a little bit like what Maha just talked about. Which makes itself into an indispensable middleman <clears throat> between any two producers and exploits them both under the pretext that they save the producers the trouble and risk of exchange, extend the sale of their products to distant markets, and are therefore the most useful class of the population. A class of parasites comes into being. Genuine social... Uh, I don't even know how to fucking say that. Um, who, as a reward for their actually very insignificant services, skim all the cream of production, cream off production at home and abroad, rapidly amass enormous wealth and correspondingly social influence and for that reason receive under civilization ever higher honors and ever greater control of production until at last they bring also they also bring forth a product of their own the periodical trade crises so he's sort of tongue in cheek right he's talking about capitalism mostly <laughs> um but it's more like class society in general in some ways where he's talking about this is all about the ruling class. And obviously that will depend on which time period you're talking about. But, you know, um, also I love the I love the comment that he says under the pretext that they save the producers the trouble and risk of exchange. How many times have you, all of us, I know we get this question in the server all the time and fucking drives me up the wall actually I don't know the server as much actually um, but it does get asked a lot um, but it's the whole like oh but the capitalists took a risk so shouldn't they blah 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 like get rewarded disproportionately it's like motherfucker no <laughs> that's not how it works um, again it's just totally just an excuse for uh, to exploit exploit the producers anyways um yeah civilization quote unquote correlates with shitty ruling classes so there you go all right final slide um i put up a few readings uh for any of you to check out like i said i think myths of male dominance is already uh posted in the chat uh, or the book club thread, so check that out. Uh, and like I said, it's a collection of articles. Um, it's not just about Engels, Morgan's Mark, Morgan and Marx. It's all a bunch of essays and articles. So you can just look through the chapters and just literally just look for stuff that interested you. So it's a freaking cool book. I really wish I had more time to go through more of it to be honest because there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there um honestly that's what we did last week a little bit that's why i didn't record it because it was a little hodgepodgey but there's just so many good like like i said i'm like decision making and foraging society i'm like that's such a fucking cool topic like i love that um you can just read about anything like that in this book so Definitely check that out. Uh, like I said, you just need just look for articles that sound interesting. You don't need to read the whole thing. It's it's pretty long, uh, and that is that is like actually bona fide anthropology. By the way, it's like if not, I think the pub like the republished version was two thousand eight, but I think it was originally in nineteen eighty one. I might be wrong, but um, you know, not the most up to date, but more up to date I'm sure there's more modern uh, material you can find as well but it's a good anthropological work that talks a lot about Angles and Morgan so obviously she is referencing this book essentially directly a little bit of Marx in there and then just generally like she's tackling the main topic obviously is the myth of male dominance so you know the the myth being that the male dominance is like a, a normal and natural phenomenon right that like oh it's always been this way it's it's a normal way of things it's it's a good thing actually like that's the myth that she's tackling it's it's all nonsense because there's a lot of historical development that is 
needed to understand how you actually get to a patriarchal society. Uh, next is a couple actually relatively short works from um, Colin Tai. Um, so for anyone who hasn't heard of her, uh, she was the... Um, oh, man, someone needs to look it up for me really fast. I might get it wrong, but I think she was like the first commissar of um, public welfare or something like that, common welfare in the USSR. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the, I think one of the fun facts, she was like the first woman ever appointed as a member of a government in history or something like that. I might be wrong, but it's something like that. She's very cool. Also, she was a, uh, I think she was on the, um, uh, what's it called? Most wanted list in America for being a communist woman. Pretty cool. Uh, she was appointed to the people's commissar for social welfare in the first Soviet government. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, she's very cool very based and she wrote um, a bunch of stuff about um, the family uh, sexual relations under uh, and class struggle and uh, it, it she has just really interesting perspectives on the family and sexual relations and all that stuff and especially valuable is she's all writing this during the revolution and like during the establishment of the USSR um, so she's addressing it from the perspective of a nascent social, socialist state, which I think is fa fascinating. Um, cause I, I think, and I know I've seen this question in the server before, but you see questions of, of all the time of like under socialism, what will blah, blah, blah be like? It's like that type of question, first of all, kind of drives me up the wall sometimes because what I would much prefer that everyone do is educate yourself in the Marxist method and materialist dialectical materialist way of thinking. And then you can answer those questions yourself or at least come up with informed opinions about them instead of parroting the opinions of other people. Um, just put that out there. Um, but anyways, it's also useful to learn from someone like Colin Tai, who was actually living in a socialist state and has a, an informed perspective on these things, right? I mean, don't ask some random person on a server, a Discord server, about what stuff's going to be like under socialism. Like, your your mileage is going to vary dramatically. Even on a, even our our server, which I think is, you know, a pretty pretty freaking good one, it's still. The answers you're going to get are to take them with a grain of salt because the answer, the answer should always be, I don't know. That's the correct answer. But you can also learn from people who actually lived a real, actual lived experience, right? Um, going back to Mao's on practice, right? Social practice, that's the pathway to knowledge. So, um, yeah, check these out if you are interested in reading more about this in the socialist context or from a socialist perspective specifically. Um, I think it's pretty interesting stuff. I think Galantai is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for now. Um, let's see. Oh, and then, yeah, um, I can put that anthropology textbook also uh, in the chat if anyone wants to browse through that. So, yeah. Obviously, feel free to find more sources and post them in the chat if you like. Um, I think it's always a good thing to just share share the literature around. I think uh, the more the merrier. Because, uh, like, you know, I think what we can take away from this reading is not that it's all gospel and 100% accurate. That's insane. Obviously... Anthropology and Marxism are both social sciences and therefore um, need to develop over time as new evidence arises. And that is what has happened since 1884. So, um, I mean, shit, even Missa Mel Domus was published a hundred damn years after 
angles, and yet we're still 40, 41 years removed from that. So think about it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there to look at. Um, but again, I think applying the you know the methodology of historical materialism to anthropology um, does give us very valuable insight, I think. And from what I gather from browsing through Leacock's book and some other sources is that it does seem like the actual evidence of anthropology does seem to um, come pretty darn close to what Morgan and Engels were arguing for based on their much more limited evidence. Uh, essentially, the evidence is converging upon this sort of materialist perspective of uh, early human society. So, yeah. Um, I hope that was a good enough summary for everybody. Um, it's a long book, and even I didn't finish it this time, so <laughs> I'm sure I left some stuff on the cutting room floor, but there you go.